Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started here. It's about 1 o'clock. Uh, on behalf of COIL, I want to thank you for coming to this Fisher series uh, talk featuring, featuring Alyssa Weiss on harnessing the data deluge, how to make learning analytics a part of teaching and learning. So Alyssa is an associate professor of education technology and learning design at Simon Fraser University. And she'll present a powerful vision of how learning analytics tools and higher education pedagogy can be integrated to support students' learning agency, instructors' learning designs, and the interactions between the two, all while working within the scope of the university course. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bart, and uh, welcome, everyone. I guess you've already covered the, the title. I just uh, wanted to, to point out that what you see here, which is an image of a wave crashing, I think is sometimes how a lot of people feel when wading into the world of learning analytics. There's all this data around everywhere. It's big, it's powerful. We feel like we want to do something to harness its power, but uh, like perhaps an experienced surfer, we don't know quite where to start. So what I'm going to do today is present one, not the only, but what I think is a pretty powerful vision of ways we can start to work with all this data to, to harness its power to make it productive in the context of university teaching and learning. So not surprisingly, the uh, topic of the talk today is learning analytics. Um, and before we get started, I always like to start off by getting a sense of what people come to the talk with. So I'm going to ask you to take a minute and picture in your mind, what do you think of when I say learning analytics? Okay, I'm going to run through a couple images now. And just for fun, and I know we have some people online, so maybe for those people they can just, they just type in. For each image I show, is that something that came to mind or comes to mind when you think of learning analytics? This is the first image, a blank. And if you're here because you're not quite sure what learning analytics is and you want to find out, that's actually a great reason to be here. So is this, is this what came to mind for anybody? Okay. And, and that's fair enough. It's a big black void and we're trying to figure out our way. How about this? Anybody? All that data out there. What about this one? A couple people. This is my uh, not particularly graphical representation of some of the algorithms and processing we use to look at the data. What about this one? And this is charts, pretty, pretty pictures. This is the one that usually gets the most hands um, because this is a visualization of uh, some data. That's actually my Facebook social network hanging out over there, um, as well as some signals, all sorts of different things. And this is what I think a lot of people think about. But when I think about learning analytics, these actually aren't the first things I think about personally. So I'm going to throw up a couple more images and see if anyone else uh, has thought about a couple things that are different. Anybody think about this guy? This is my friend Joe. He's an online instructor. Um, this picture was taken in the winter. It's kind of cold out. And this is him late at night, mug of coffee in hand. After a long day of teaching, he actually also teaches face-to-face -face courses. And he wants to understand what's going on with his students. So he's at home, pouring over the data, figuring out who's getting what, who needs help, what does he need to do differently, and how is he going to lecture, facilitate, and do all the teaching things we do the next day. What about these guys? Anybody think about the students? To me, this is maybe one of the most important but not often thought about pieces of learning analytics, which is really it's why we're all here, right? We're in higher education. Our goal is to work with these students. And I think we can do that in lots of ways. We can support them indirectly, but there's also a lot of powerful ways in which we can help them start to work with their analytics directly and become active as part of this whole data process that we're trying to figure out. So. For those of us who are new, let's just start off with a basic. What is learning analytics? This is a pretty basic definition, but it's one that I find useful. So we can think about learning analytics as the collection and analysis of data traces related to learning in order to improve and inform the process, and hopefully also the outcome. Now, all education research is trying to do this, but with learning analytics, the cycle is much quicker. We're trying to do this much faster because we're looking at data and trying to act on it often in close to real time. And that's why I want to point out a difference between learning analytics and, wait for it, learning analytics. 
Um, because when people talk about learning analytics, they're often talking about quite different things. So there's one vision of learning analytics that kind of looks like this. And another one, the one that I'm going to be talking about today, that looks like this. And the first one is often referred to as academic analytics. It has to do with administrators. It has to do with learning designers. It has to do with people who are a little more removed from the day to day. And they're working with data that's usually on completed activities. So they'll get the data after a course ends. On the other hand, with teachers and students, we have the possibility to look at data and act on it while the activities are still in progress. In the first case, a lot of times we're looking at outcome data. We're looking at course grades, GPA, those sorts of things. But while we're inside a course, we can also look at process data. So we can look very distinctly at how students are moving through the learning activities in class. There's often a long time cycle versus a short one. And in the first case, we're trying to make some pretty big global changes to how we do business at a university. Whereas here, we might be able to make more local adjustments that can be fine-tuned to the needs of a particular learning situation. So both are valuable. The one on the left is what a lot of work is doing currently. And uh, for those people in the learning analytics space, we've probably heard a lot about predicting retention rates and dropout rates and all of that. And I think that's very important, and it's a great place to start. But what I'm going to talk about today is something completely different, which is what's on the right side. Maybe not completely different, somewhat different. Um, and it's how do we bring these learning analytics in to what we're doing in the classroom. And I think that offers some exciting leverage to change how teaching and learning and how teachers and students interact. So my question that I'm going to hopefully provide some answers for today is how do we help learning analytics be an innovation that makes a real impact on teaching and learning? And I'm going to boldly say maybe even revolutionize higher education. I think there's a lot of pressures on the university today. There's a lot of financial pressures, there's pressures from students, there's information out there. What are we doing? How are we educating students? How, you know, why are they going to keep showing up to lecture theaters to, to hear people talk when there's so much more interactivity out there? So how can we start to use some of these learning analytics as a, as a wedge to, to change some of the things that have been going on for a long time? Because if we don't, this is the fate. And I don't know if you see, you said there's a lovely little pointer right up there. Learning analytics. Yet another box on the discarded heap of technologies we thought were going to make a big difference in education, we put a lot of money into, and at the end of the day, were oversold and underused, as Larry Kuda likes to say. So in order to do this, we need to design for ways in which analytics can usefully reflect and inform the teaching and learning practices of instructors and students. And I want to point out something important in the slide, because a lot of people, we read what we want to read, and people read this and they say, we need to design analytics. Oh, you'll notice that's not what the slide is saying. The slide says we need to design for ways in which analytics can inform the process. So I'm going to be talking about the design of analytics some, but more importantly, how do we work with the analytics we're able to get a hold of? And I think in the context of universities, that's really important because we don't always, you know, we're not always going to be making homegrown solutions of analytics that are specific for the situation. We're going to have to work with a suite of analytics that we get from a vendor. And then the question is, how do we make that actionable and useful in our situation? So we're not going to talk about just learning analytics, but a few other things as well. So with learning analytics, we can talk about a couple different pieces of the puzzle. The first one is calculating and calculating, capturing and calculating meaningful traces of activity. Then there's that picture of presenting them in a useful form. But I also want to add in this last piece, supporting the interpretation and use of analytics as part of decision making. And I want to try and keep in mind that even when we're thinking about what traces to capture, we want to think about these people, the people that are here working on the ground in learning analytics. So the two big questions I'm going to try and talk about today are, one, how do we develop rich indicators that can be meaningful to different teachers and students as reflections of their particular practices of learning and teaching? And how do we consider and design for the ways in which the analytics can then play a part in the larger activity patterns of these instructors and students. So we'll start off with first part, thinking about rich indicators. And I want to keep in mind that these rich indicators, they're not rich in some abstract sense. We want to figure out how we make indicators that can be rich to particular teachers and students in particular learning situations. Because while when we're working with the data, you know, we're off in a room somewhere, when you're learning or when you're teaching, you're in a classroom. You're interacting with other people. And so I think we need to move away from the image of data mining. Not that data mining isn't useful and the activities aren't useful, but when we think about the data mining analogy, 
we often think about large movers of ground going in, sifting up, and kind of seeing what's there and what we can do with it. David Schaefer has said maybe we need a little bit more of a disciplined and theory approach. We need to think about data geology. The big difference in the metaphor, and these are obviously all metaphors, uh, the big difference in the metaphor is that with geology, we have some underlying model of what we think it looks like under the ground before we go down there. And so we know a little bit more about what we're looking for and what we're trying to extract. But I'd like to take these analogies one step further and say that we're not just thinking about geology, because that's looking for objects, but what we're really doing is data archaeology. We're looking at objects as a reflection of a particular activity, a particular culture of a classroom that existed at some point in time. And if we're doing learning analytics real time, which is one of our goals, we actually may even think about it as data anthropology because we have the people available to us. You know, imagine if you're an archaeologist, you're looking at pottery remains, and you had the chance to go back to the potter and say, hey, why did you make the bowl this way? So it's not just about the data, but it's also about understanding what the data means, what it represented, what activity in the world it represented, and how do we learn about that, both from the data itself and from the people who were involved in it who we might actually have access to. So the first question that I always have when I look at learning analytics is, what's the learning model? And for a lot of the analytics that are happening right now, there's one model, so it seems like it's the default model, and the learning model is more is better. More logins to an LMS, more clicks here, more clicks there, more viewing of discussion posts, more of whatever. And the next question is then, well, what's that a proxy for? Right? Is more always better? Usually we're talking about more effort. But I would like to say that we can do better. Um, We've been doing a lot of analysis of online learning for many years, and we have lots of theories about how it's going on. And so while more is better can be very useful, I think we can come up with some other models that help us dig in a little bit more about what's going on. Because it's not just about only identifying students who are in trouble and saying, you know, you need to do more, but it's also saying, well, you need to do differently. Or you, you need to do less, maybe, in some cases. If it's an unproductive behavior they're engaging in. So we want to think about how do we understand more about what they're doing, and not just identifying who, but identifying what needs to change. In order to do that, we need to bring in learning theory as part of the learning analytics. So this is what I sort of talk about as second generation learning analytics. And it's trying to move a little bit beyond just counting what's there, but thinking about what we're counting, why we're counting it, how we're counting it. Maybe we need to subdivide and not count everything the same. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And it's taking things a step further. Because at the end of the day, I don't think one size fits all. And I think with learning analytics, you know, we get lots of big data, and there's a lot of pressure to sort of find these overarching models. At the same time, we, we all know that education and teaching and learning doesn't work that way. And so we have a really tricky balancing act and a tight wire that we have to walk between things that are generalizable enough that we don't just spend all this energy building them and using them just once, but also that are really, in some ways, tailored to meet the needs of a particular situation. So I want to give you as an example, and this uh, I think hopefully will make this a bit more concrete, and it comes from my own research. What do you all see here? Lots of links as part of a threaded discussion. So we started off saying, well, we should build some learning analytics for online discussion forums. Seems like a pretty good idea, right? Only one problem. I kind of saw that on the video. Yeah. <laughs> online discussion forum is a tool. And so in fact, it's very hard to make online discussion forum learning analytics because what you want to measure and what's good depends on the educational purpose for which you're using it. So people use online discussion forums for all sorts of things. One common example is Q&A. And I read an interesting paper recently in which they found that greater use of an online discussion forum that was being used for Q&A uh, was a predictor of failure of the course. Well, that seems terrible. Well, we should tell people, never look at the Q&A forum, right? It's a very bad idea. Well, digging a little deeper, that's not what's going on. It turns out the Q&A forum is where people who had no idea what was happening in the course went. So it was a good predictor of people who were in trouble in the course, because they didn't know what was going on. They had questions. They were looking for answers. But in this particular course, it wasn't a high-level discussion of people trying to learn more. It was people who were floundering, and unfortunately, other people who were floundering who didn't really have very good answers for them. So useful predictor of who was in trouble, 
not a good indicator of what was going on. So it's important to know what's happening in, in a discussion. It can also get used for reading responses where you want to make sure people are doing it. Whether they're reading what other people wrote may not matter to you. There could be something with team decision making. I've seen them used for that, in which case seeing that people are looking at each other's ideas and coming to a consensus becomes important. Sometimes we're going for dialogue. Other times we might even use one for peer review or perhaps argumentation. So my point is that when we're thinking about learning analytics, what's going on here, the different educational purposes, is as if not more important than the tool that's being used. You can imagine doing peer review perhaps in a wiki, perhaps in a blog format, may have more similarities, even if your metrics differ, than discussion forum as a thing we create analytics for. So this is where I'm going to introduce a little bit of my own research on the e-listening project. And this started off as a project to try and understand what's going on in online discussions, how can we measure and track it, and how we can use that to inform what's going on. Um, and this is a project that I ran with the support of the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for the last four years. And so the first thing we said was, well, if we're going to be tracking data, we better, we better have a model of what we think is happening in these online discussions that we want to track and how that's going to lead to learning. So again, here's where we ran into the tension between a model that's specific enough to be useful to generate analytics that people are going to find useful in their teaching and learning, and not developing something that's so niche that no one besides us would ever want to use it. My background comes from research in computer-supported collaborative learning, and we have lots and lots of really exciting models for studying collaboration that are about a thousand feet above the ground. And most teachers and instructors and students aren't going to want to engage with them. So we tried to kind of find something that was in the middle ground that was theoretically grounded but could also be applied in more than one situation, and that was accessible. So coming from a social constructivist perspective, we thought about online discussions as a form for learning through conversation. So it's not a Q&A space in this case, but it's about students having a chance to articulate their ideas, having to put words to what they're thinking, how to put that out there, being exposed to the ideas of others. So generally, we work in situations where you know it's not answering factual questions, but trying to debate things that could be seen from multiple ways, and often negotiating the differences in perspective to understand them differently and perhaps come to a so we have this model of what students ought to be doing, which has to do with externalizing their ideas by putting them in. In other words, they make some posts. Then they go and they take in the externalizations of others by reading their posts. They hopefully then think about things and make a new post. And so that's the cycle of activity we hope to see. And that led us to think about, well, what can we collect for data? Well, we can look at both sides of this. We can look at how students contribute comments and how they attend to the messages of others. And from the name you listening, you can kind of see already, we started off focusing more on accessing others' messages because uh, simply it's low-hanging fruit. It's a lot easier to track than running semantic analysis of the text in a conversation. But obviously, that needs to come next. Uh, so in our conceptual model, we think about what students put into the conversation as speaking. And at the fundamental level, it's simply a way that they share their ideas. And past research in online learning has shown that there's value in speaking that's recurring. In other words, students are part of an ongoing conversation. They don't come in and make one comment or come in the day before the end of the discussion and make seven comments. Um, that's responsive. It's responding to what other people are saying. And that it's rationale. And that comes from the argumentation literature. So if they're giving an opinion, they give a reason for it. Ideally, that reason even has evidence. But even if it's just a reasoning, that's a start. Because then other people can reply to it. Uh, we want it to be distributed temporally and conversationally. In other words, they're participating in the different parts of the conversation and over time. And moderately portioned, which is a nice way of saying that very, very short posts rarely have quality content. But students often use online discussions as a forum for essay writing, which in fact is not really right for the medium and other students really don't want to read. So speaking is very visible in the online system, but not all qualities of it are salient in the system as most interfaces interact. For example, distribution in time. You, know, you see an online discussion. You can see, oh, I made some posts. But you can't see exactly how many, where they are in the conversation, and when they were made. Um, the post quality information is really valuable. But as I mentioned, it's somewhat complex to assess. And that's where some of the next project work will be going. Uh, but it turns out we can get a lot without even having to go there. And that's when we move to the listening side. So attending to the ideas of others is a critical but generally invisible part of online discussion. Um, it's often been referred to as lurking, 
Um, and I, I won't go on that rant today, but there's a lot of reasons why I think thinking of it as lurking is really harmful. When we think about lurking, you generally seem to think about someone maybe cloaked in black, hiding in the back of the room, looking over people's shoulders, not someone who's a part of the conversation. But if you're in a conversation, listening, and listening actively to what other people are saying, is a really important part of conversation. It's kind of requisite for being responsive. So we've tried to reconceptualize lurking as this sort of bad thing into the positive thing that it is in conversations, which is listening. And in fact, there's some interesting research uh, that came out of, I think it was a group at Microsoft, showing that the people who are the biggest lurkers are often also the biggest contributors. So we need to really rethink about that as a part of what's going on, especially if our goal is dialogue. Um, again, drawing on the literature, and this is some of my own work as well as some others, there's value in listening that is broad yet deep. Because if we want people to be exposed to different perspectives, they need to look at a broad variety of posts. But at the same time, you don't want them skimming over things. You want them to engage in somewhat of a deep way. And what we were able to find was the degree to which people were broad yet deep in attending to others' posts actually predict their content quality. And when I say content quality, we're specifically measuring this, the degree to which they were rationale. Also integrated, we want their views informed by others. And uh, we also want value in listening that's recurrent. In other words, it turns out there's value in revisiting posts you've already read because it provides context for the flow. And uh, we actually found that while the number of posts people view don't predict very much of how they interact in a discussion, the number of times they revisit posts and reread them predicts how responsive they are in their own posts. And so I think that's an example of what I was talking about with second generation learning analytics in that it's not just they clicked on some stuff, but, oh, it turns out that if they go back and revisit the thing a second time, that second click tells us something that seeing it once didn't. And so we've portioned that out, and it actually makes a difference in what we're able to predict. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this area for research is that early research suggested, first we thought, oh, we'll have online discussions, and students will love to talk, and they'll do great. Um, and pretty quickly, we saw that didn't happen most of the time. Then people seemed to think that Students were just generally bad at online discussing. But it turns out it's neither one of those things, but different students do different things. So we've seen students who are very disregardful in looking at other people's posts. We've seen a lot of students take a coverage approach where they sort of skim the whole conversation but don't actually really engage in much at all. We see people take a focused approach where they're very deeply engaged but only in a portion. And then we see students who are thorough, which is sort of both broad and deep across the conversation. This is interesting because once we have different profiles of student activity, we have a really great place to make personalized interventions based on analytics. So here's not all, but some of the analytics that we've been working with. And I've sort of set this up to show the connection with the learning model. So we think about things that are on the left-hand side, like temporal distribution. So that we measure in terms of the percent of sessions in which students make posts. So are they going in and just reading, or are they going in and reading and posting as well? We look at their speaking quantity, which uh, is perhaps the least interesting thing we're able to track, which is just the number and length of posts. Um, and then we look at listening breadth, which I think is one of the most interesting ones. And we can both look at the percentage of posts that they view, which means they click on something, and the percent of posts that we think they might have really read. And basically, the difference between those two metrics is that based on the length of a post, we can knock out all the things that they clicked on really quickly and moved on from. And it's not the best metric. There'd be better ways to see. And there can be good reasons for looking at a post and then moving on. But in general, if you're seeing a huge difference between the percentage of posts they click on and the percentage they're actually looking at, that suggests perhaps there's something unproductive going on. Uh, we've also looked at listening reoccurrence which has to do with the number of times they review their own posts or others. One of those things I mentioned was very useful in predicting responsiveness. And conversational distribution, the degree to which they're participating in different parts of the conversation. But despite our really wonderful metrics, that are far, I think are pretty good because they're theoretically grounded, it turns out one size still doesn't fit all. And those metrics just put out there aren't going to mean the same thing in every single class. And so after developing these metrics, we started to think about, well, how do you productively bring them into a classroom in a way that doesn't seem like some researchers up on a hill somewhere came up with a bunch of good metrics, and you know, here you go, thank you very much. And so what we started to think about was the next question, which is activity patterns. What are teachers and students doing in their coursework, and how do you bring that in in a way that it's not this add-on, you know, it's not always there on another screen of the LMS that nobody looks at, but how do you really make it a part 
of, of teaching and learning practices. So that's kind of where we're going to go in a minute. Maybe I'll pause and see. Are there any questions so far? I think they wanted to see how do you consume it. So just a quick question to clarify, a recurrence. Uh, when I start a thread and then I go back and follow the conversation, is this recurrent or I go actually to my own posts anyway? Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, the way that we are tracking recurrence is it's revisiting a post that you have previously viewed. Uh, so we track it separately. It, it's listed here with a slash, but there are two different metrics, actually. One is how many times do you go back and look at a post that you made previously, anywhere that it was, and that one actually doesn't turn out to be very useful. But the other is how many times do you go back and look at a post by someone else that they made previously, you read it, and then you read it again. And that's what we found has been interesting. I do think the notion of tracking, revisiting the same threads is interesting. It's, it's a bit more complicated, and we haven't tried that one yet. All right. Seems like everybody's ready for activity patterns. So the big question is, how do we fit these learning analytics into the way that we do school? And maybe does that need to change the way that we do school? To which I would say yes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move from how do we capture traces of activity to the idea of supporting interpretation and use of those activities, analytics in decision making. So we move from thinking about learning analytics to thinking about learning analytics intervention. And that's the surrounding frames of activity through which the learning analytics are going to be taken up by people as part of some larger educational activity. And I think this is really crucial. Even if you don't like the analytics that I'm developing and you've got some other set you think are great, this second piece is much more global and really important because if we don't find a way to pull these in usefully, they're going to sit on the side. So the kinds of questions that I think we need to think about that I don't think are being asked nearly often enough are the locally contextualized questions about interpretation and action. So the kinds of questions that you can think about for whatever situation that you're working in has to do with who should be accessing particular kinds of analytics. Instructors, students, administrators, learning designers, teaching assistants, academic advisors. But more importantly, not just that, but when should they be consulting these analytics? At what point? What processes? With what frequency? Why are they consulting with them? What questions are they answering? And I think that's a key one. A lot of times we go to the data to see what it says. And sometimes that can be good. And in the early days, maybe it's OK. But at some point, we want to be going to those analytics with questions, questions that matter. So we're not finding things that are just interesting, but we're finding things that are actionable and helpful. We also need to think about what the analytics mean in this particular situation and what to do about it. How did the information relate to what activity happened? I gave the example earlier with the Q&A forum. Just seeing that somebody's low on that metric or it's low on that metric and that matches the pie achievement in the course doesn't always necessarily tell us what we need to do unless we know how the tool was being used in the course and how the pieces fit together. And finally, how does this fit in? What is done differently? Where and when are we expecting students to change their behaviors? Is this just a one-off for students at risk and we find, okay, we need to do a targeted intervention right now? Or are there are ways in which we can pull learning analytics in as part of the regular way we do school as part of a, a metacognitive process that's helping students be more aware of their learning and develop it, regardless of whether they're at the top or the bottom end of the academic spectrum. So there's a model that uh, has been put out for teachers that I think is a useful one, and I'll draw on a little bit. And it talks about connecting the use of learning analytics to the practice of learning design. And that's suggesting that when an instructor goes into a class, they have a learning design. We're going to do some activities. I think it's going to result in this kind of learning. We then can use the learning analytics to see if that happens. We can also say, I'm going to do these activities. I expect students to interact in these ways. Again, the analytics can kind of be done as a check. But when it comes to students, I think it's a bit trickier. And so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk today is a model for thinking about how do we help students work with analytics? How do we make analytics student-facing? And how do we embed these to support students in being purposeful in their learning? 
And that's maybe uh, the same thing as saying more metacognitive, more intentional, active agents. And this is something that can support them in some of the lifelong learning goals that I think we have as sort of a meta goal for, for education. I'm going to take a moment just to talk about why maybe students are an important group to think about. Um, usually they're sort of at the bottom of the, the chain of where, where people think about analytics going. We want to start off with administration, maybe move through advising, then we get instructors on board, and finally someday we'll get to students. But I think we should turn that upside down and maybe think about bringing the students in now. I think it's important because I think it's giving them a chance to engage as active partners in their learning. I think that's addressing one of the pressures we see of students saying, well, big lectures, I'm sitting there passively, I'm doing all these active things online, you know, that's a big disconnect. This is giving them a chance to be active. It also, they have the ability to make immediate local changes. If an administrator sees something in the data, if a teacher sees something in the data, you have to think about, well, when and how am I going to act on that? But if a student sees something in their own data, they can make the change right there and then, maybe. It can activate metacognitive processes. There's this notion of empowerment instead of enslavement. And I'm not going to focus on today, but there's quite a bit of uh, concern with analytics about privacy issues, about Big Brother, about students feeling that analytics are being done to them or on them or without their um, at least explicit consent, a lot of the things that have come out in the news recently. Um, if we get students involved in looking at their own data and feeling that they have the power to look at their own data and talk about what it means, I think we can move away from some of those problems and avoid going down some, some pretty dangerous paths. It also can democratize access to data. Students may, we could say, have a right to see their own data. And finally, we talk a lot about the power of big data, but as it gets bigger, it can be hard for one person to manage, even with all the great tools and analytics. With students looking at their own data, it's the only time you're ever going to get a one-to-one -one ratio between data producers and data analysts. Of course, there's some challenges and opportunities. I think some of the biggest challenges are that if students are going to look at analytics and make sense of them in the way I've described that's context relevant, they need to have some idea of the pedagogical intent. So if they're going to say, oh, look, I did, uh, you know, I was very low in this measure for a discussion forum, huh, I wonder what I was supposed to be doing in there. Was I supposed to be interacting a lot? Was I supposed to be reading what other people post? They need to know what that model was. And I would argue that that's good educational practice, but not something we always do. Um, they also need to recognize productive patterns of activity. So even if students know this is a place for dialogue, they may not connect that with, huh, if it's a place for dialogue, I should probably read a whole bunch of other people's posts. Um, and they're also going to need quite a bit of active self-regulatory skills. And those are the metacognitive skills, which are important, but they may not have had practice or training in. On the other hand, I think these all present opportunities in that sharing the instructional purpose of what we're doing in classrooms and why gives students a way better chance of doing what we hope they're going to do because they're, they're in on the game, right? There, there shouldn't be a secret behind while we're doing it. Um, and I think that being proactive and monitoring your own learning is something we've seen lots and lots of research in terms of supporting better processes and outcomes. So just a few other things to think about, and then I'll kind of throw, throw out the model of how we've been coming at this problem. Um, I think we need to think about the transparency of the data capture, analysis, and access. That's going to be important for all the institutional reasons, but also for students to buy into these metrics. We need to be careful of the rigidity of interpretation, because there is a tendency to think more is better, and more isn't always better. And finally, we don't want the analytics to become the end all, because there's lots of things that we can't measure or we can't measure yet. But that doesn't mean they're not important. So just a couple other things to keep in mind. So what I'm going to present now is a model for learning analytics intervention for students that's designed to help them be more purposeful in how they approach learning. So there's sort of two foundations, three processes, four principles, and we're done. So not surprisingly for a model of learning analytics, we start off with learning analytics at the center. But that changes almost immediately because I think we need to think about the learning analytics and the learning activities together from the start. Now, if you're designing your own analytics, you can make analytics that are going to reflect your activity perfectly. On the other hand, if you don't get to design your own analytics, you still need to think about what analytics are relevant for what I'm doing here. You may get a whole suite of analytics in a dashboard, but direct your students to focus on certain ones. So we need to think about how the learning analytics reflect the activities from the start. And so this is the notion, the principle of integration. And the integration has to do with a couple of different levels. First, 
we need to think about how the learning analytics reflect the activities, but they also need to be brought in as a key piece of the puzzle. So using learning analytics isn't this thing you do and then you go learn. Learning analytics and looking at them and making sense of them is a part of the learning process. And it needs to be tied to the course goals and activities. So I think about a couple of conceptual questions, and then we'll talk about a couple of practical questions. So the conceptual piece has to do, given the goals of this particular educational activity, what metrics are important to focus on? So I may have all these metrics for online discussions, but depending on whether I'm doing a Q&A forum or a dialogue, I may say certain ones are important today and not tomorrow. Sometimes you may have analytic systems that let you toggle things on and off, but even not, we can also go with the very lo-fi uh, approach of saying, look at this, don't look at this. More importantly, or perhaps equally importantly, what do productive and unproductive patterns in these metrics look like? If we want to get away from more is better, we're going to want to have more sophisticated metrics that don't just show amounts, but perhaps show patterns over time. But also we want to know, you know, is more better? Should I always be reading more posts? Should I always be making more posts? Well, there's no top level that can keep going on forever, so that's not always going to be the case. We want to want to make sure that this thread between learning goals, student actions, and analytics, and the feedback is clear so that students see the connections, and then how to bring these analytics into the course flow. So if we take a look at these analytics, I'm going to talk through how we've started to use these in a course. And these are the ones I'm going to focus on. I mentioned them earlier, the percent of posts viewed and read. So the first way that we pulled analytics in and we tried to integrate them into the course was we literally made them part of the interface. And so what you see here is actually the discussion forum. Um, it's visualized in this way. It has sort of a central thread, and then it goes off in different directions. Students can see the posts that they haven't ever looked at in red, the ones that they've clicked on and viewed at least once in blue. They can see the ones that they've posted themselves, which are in this kind of teal color that's not showing up very well right now. And they can, excuse me, navigate through here. So I'm going to show just a two-minute clip so you can kind of see what this looks like in real time. So the idea is that this is a dynamic interface that moves around. So students can easily see, in this case, they haven't really looked at much until it starts. And they start to, to click through on things, and they can see, track their progress through it. It gives them a sense when they come back the next time of what they've looked at already and what they haven't. It gives them a sense of how they've distributed their activity because they can see where their posts are in time. And it's not so much about learning analytics, but this is also designed to support students in integrating reading multiple posts because as they view different posts, they can keep typing there and bring their words with them. So they can read lots of different posts, keep composing a reply that travels with them at the different posts, and then finally post it. That's what this is showing. So these aren't all the analytics, but we've put a few of them there. So they can see that very clearly how they've distributed their activity in the forum, and they can see very clearly what percentage of posts they've viewed and where they are. But that's not going to be true of most analytics. We're not going to be able to pull them all into the interface. So other ones need to be extracted and reintegrated back into the learning activity. And so what you see here is how we pulled all the other ones in. And this is a very basic chart. You could do lots of more exciting visualizations, but it was a starting point. And this just tells each student at the end of each week what they did, what was the class average, and there's a place for them to make observations. So we could throw this out at students, but I really wouldn't expect very much to happen. So the rest of the talk is about how do, how do we bring this into the course in a meaningful way? And we started off doing this with what we talked about as a process of grounding. So before the analytics even came in, we talked to the students and said, we're going to be doing some online discussions. Maybe we want to know a little bit about what those are and why we're doing them. So we started off by talking about what's the purpose of engaging in, in this case, online discussions. And it's what I talked about earlier about articulating your ideas, seeing others' views, negotiating. And then the instructor was able to share their expectations for productive process of doing this. So the example that I'm focusing on is the breath. So attending deeply to a spectrum of others' ideas and contributing comments that are then responsive and rational. And how does the learning analytics provide indicators of this process? Well, the percent of posts read is introduced not just as this number, oh, here, look, the percentage of posts you read, 
but it's one which has clear meaning in the context of this activity because we've already talked about the goal is to see other people's views. We want you to do that, and here's a metric of it. So by the time the learning analytic is introduced, it's really clearly tied to the activity and why it's being engaged in. Um, so the way that this works, and this can be talked about or just done through the online interface, is there's discussion participation guidelines. And you know they're tied together. So it says broad listening is something that you want to do. And look, the interface shows you very clearly what percentage of posts you viewed at least once. Separately, you're going to get a guideline about the learning analytics that says when you get this information, it's going to tell you about the post, percent of posts you've read. And you'll notice trying to get away from more is better. It's good to read as many posts as possible. However, when time is limited, better to view a portion in depth than everything superficially. Now, some people think that's a little bit fuzzy as a guideline to aim towards. Unfortunately, in this case, I think it's the best expression of what we want to happen. So we do want more breadth, but not at the expense of depth. depth. And that's a trade-off that puts students in the driver's seat about what they're able to do given the limitations of a certain age. So the piece that's then complementary, so that's the integration. That's sort of the top-down, instructor-driven, here's how the analytics fit into my vision of the course. And that's complemented by agency, which is where the students get to say how the analytics fit into their version of the course. And the main goal is to uh, deal with a little bit of this, which is the sense of who's watching me. And the answer is, well, you're watching yourself. We're going to have other people involved. You're not there by yourself, but you're watching yourself. And that, I think, makes it a whole lot less true. Um, so I think student agency is something that we, we've known is important from the educational literature for a while. Particularly in the context of learning analytics, it gives students the opportunity to establish personal goals for the activity in relation to the larger instructional goals. And there's a lot of really nice literature um, from the self-regulated learning field showing that you can tell students what their goals should be, but they're still going to have their own goals. And so instead of pretending that's not happening, this is giving them a chance to express them and hopefully articulate them in a positive way with what we're seeing as the larger instructional goals. Question. Yes. Um, student agency is the notion of, be careful with my words here, it's the notion of empowering students. It's that the students are active agents who are responsible for and in charge of and able to make decisions about their own learning. They're not doing this in a vacuum, they're not the only ones who are in charge, but it's it's treating them as adults. It's asking them to take on, giving them the right to make decisions about their learning, but also giving them a responsibility for understanding what's going on and, and making decisions because of it. Um, and some of that's about having authority in what the analytics say. So instead of being told, you know, your analytics say this about you, here's the data. What do you see in it? Here's what we see in it. It's, it's opening that up a little bit. It's also giving them a chance to provide human context to the data. You might have a student who looks like they, they bombed out in a week or a semester, and it turns out that was you know, a semester in which they had some real family troubles. Now, that can come out in other ways, but if, it's, if they're given a chance to say, OK, I know that was an anomaly. I know why that happened. That's some of the anthropology piece. That's saying the data doesn't tell the whole story. The person who was there does have something to contribute. And the last piece I think is really important if we want analytics to make a difference is it's about what actions to take as a result. Because you can tell a student, you know, this isn't going well, you should do this. But that's not supporting them in problem solving about how to approach future problems. It's also not ensuring that they're going to do what's needed if it's not what they think they need to do. So I think it's also acknowledging as a change model, if we want students to change, they need to be on board with that change. Um, and so the way I've been working with this is through a process of goal setting and reflection. So the goal setting allows for multiple possible profiles of productive activity and improvement rather than a single path. Because I think a danger with learning analytics is you know, everybody must be shooting on an ever upward trajectory towards 100%. And that's not how it always happens. So for some students, they can set more reasonable proximate goals. I want to improve in this way. Some students may have different reasons for engaging in a course, especially if we're starting to look at MOOCs. So they can set goals that are in relation to the overarching goals, but that work for them at that point in time. Um, there's also quite a bit of work that shows that self-set goals are more motivational for learners to put in greater effort, support them in monitoring what's going on, and they'll have increased commitment to meet challenges along the way. So the way that we've, we've worked with this is that the discussion guidelines that I presented earlier 
present the metrics as a starting point for consideration, not an absolute arbiter of engagement. And I think that was reflected in the sort of uh, looser wording of you know, broad but deep. The goal setting is also an explicit part of what's going on in the course. So each week, students are asked to set a goal or two about what they're going to do in the discussion that week in an online reflection journal. It holds them accountable, so it's available for the instructor to see, though they may not always get a chance to. And, and students can take this up. So, you know, I aim to raid all, okay, really most posts in the discussion and actively participate in two threads in addition to any I create. Well, since I didn't hit last week's goal, really, I still need to do that, keep the length of my posts down, and get more interactive with the other kids. So you can see these are some pretty honest engagements of students in setting goals. And I think the important one in the second point that you'll see again later is that it turns out setting a goal doesn't mean you're going to reach it. And sometimes they have to set the same goal. So it changes this long process. And by having them set weekly goals and seeing if they've met them, it's encouraging that self-reflective cycle. And the last one I put up there to point out as a goal for the next discussion, I'll try to synthesize ideas from different thread areas. That's a really good thing we want to happen. It's not tracked by the analytics. And so we were very careful to try and say, the goal, you, know, you want some things the analytics can track, but not everything has to be. There needs to be space for things that we're not tracking yet because we don't want them eliminated. Um, and then the other piece, and this is where I think learning analytics have this big power, is the notion of data-informed reflection. And this is a key piece of learning analytics use. We're not just saying, what does the data say? But what does the data say about what I did in the context of what I set as goals, and what does it mean, and then what do I do about it? Um, when we're thinking about reflection, there's this sort of dual danger of handing these analytics there all the time. And you know, anyone who's ever put up a website and wants to check the web traffic every 30 seconds knows about this. If you have it there all the time, you can sort of distract you from other things. And so we don't want people checking their analytics so much that they're not doing the real activities for learning. And there's also the danger if it's always there, you never get a chance to look at it. So what we've tried to work with is a rhythm for reflection. And with these particular online discussions, a, work, a week was really great because each discussion lasted a week. So there was this week-long cycle of goal setting and reflection. That's not perfect for all situations. You have to figure out the rhythm in your context. It could be a semester. It could be having to do with units in a course. But having some sort of week cycle of goal setting, reviewing analytics, updating, revising goals so that students always have a proximal goal in mind as opposed to something they did at the beginning of the semester and forgot about, I think it's pretty useful. Um, and I think it's also important to provide a dedicated space for accountability. It also gives students a chance to look back over time and see their progress and also perhaps see what they haven't yet gotten to. Um, and this, this is just one example of a student reflection based on some of the data we provided. And what I thought was pretty interesting is that this, this uh, little reflection starts off being a little formulaic in that, well, I wanted to up the, try and up the percentage of posts that I reviewed each week. I had to slow down my reading since the data wouldn't record it if I looked quickly. So it's almost a little bit towards gaming the system, except you know, instead of just you know, leaving the screen open, the student said, well, I tried to read more slowly, which is sort of a mechanistic thing. But it turns out that the, the student ended up feeling like they were actually getting more out of reading slower. So you know, sort of trying to optimize this metric actually turns into something useful. So that's sort of how we've got the, pro, the, the model framed, in that there's, there's integration, which makes analytics part of the larger picture that the instructor is setting. But then there's this piece of student agency. And to help negotiate between the two, we've been talking about the issue of reference frame and dialogue. Um, Reference frame is simply the comparison point to which students orient when they examine their analytics. Um, so there's one reference point that I've talked about quite a bit already, which is theoretical patterns. And that's what's shown in the guidelines. There's also peer activity, which is, I think, what most learning analytics systems tend to, to show. And there's also students' own prior activity. And we get there. Um, I think it's really important to continually remind students of the theoretical patterns. We said it at the beginning, but keeping that fresh in their mind is important. I also think for them to have a chance to look at their own progress and goals is really important, because we're not expecting all students to be the same as the best students in the class. Um, and that's why I think comparisons of peers can be very valuable. We've seen already students find out, oh, I didn't know other people were, I don't know, actually studying. I should do that. Yes, we've heard that. Um, but I think there's a big danger with peer comparison as well. And, and the danger is that we don't want everyone to be like the average student. 
Um, students sometimes need to study different amounts to get to the same place. Uh, there was some nice work that I saw that you've been doing here at Penn State, which helps students see how they compare to other students who are similar to them. I think that can be really useful. But I also think that it's not just compared to others, but you know, showing that a student improves a lot, even if they're still below the average, is important in supporting their motivation and keeping them engaged. So this is just a couple of mentions that students have made um, about the reference point, for example, of the cheer, being surprised to see what other people were doing. But also some of the danger. So you know, sometimes students say, oh, I'm, I'm kind of depressed. I'm not doing as well as everyone else. I guess I might as well give up. Not, not what we want the learning analytics to do. Um, and I thought this last one kind of strikes a nice balance, showing that, well, I may not be doing as well as everyone else, but I did improve, and I feel good about that. And that's a place to start. Um, dialogue is a bit trickier of a principle, because I think it's really valuable, and yet it's one of the hardest things to do at scale. Um, but it's the notion that there's a space of negotiation around the interpretation of the analytics. And if you think about anyone here who's worked with analytics, you sit down and look at the data, it can be tough to figure out what it all means, what does it mean in this context. So the idea that that's going to be straightforward for students, I think, is, is a bit false. So the idea is that analytics are a start, but not the end. Helping students have a say in what's going on, and also realizing that even when students know what's going on, it doesn't mean that they know how to change it. Um, and I think the, new, the use of this sort of neutral data as a leverage can be really powerful, especially in conversations, for, how, for example, with academic advisors. And you know, suddenly you have a conversation that's not just you know, me and you, but it's me and you and this data. And we can talk around the data as this neutral object and try to understand what it means. And you know, do we want it to change? How might it change? And I think it can really change those conversations. So the way that we worked with dialogue in this case was there's a conversation between each student and the instructor about their participation that's grounded in the analytics. Now the conversation is very one-sided. The student says a lot, and the instructor says a little as and when needed. On the other hand, the student's reflection is going where the instructor can see it, so it's very different than just asking students to think about it on their own. And this was done in an online reflective journal. It was conducted through kind of a wiki, but um, you could do it in other ways. You could also think about having peer partners um, and perhaps teaching assistants come in. There could be ways to just identify which students need the instructor to have the dialogue with them, so maybe not everyone needs the dialogue. Um, but these are just a couple of examples. The first one is a student post. And it just sort of points out that you know, the student brought in some information about being out of town and that they had to start the discussion late. And then that really changed how they interacted. But that's, I think, useful because it's bringing in another piece to understand the data and showing how it changed. And in the second example, this is a, a quote from an instructor trying to use the uh, data as a neutral point to uh, bring up a conversation that they've already had with the student that hasn't really gone anywhere, saying that, you know, you keep saying that you want to bring down the number of posts and make them higher quality, but it looks like you're not doing that. So what, what can you say here? What can you do? Um, and this is just one particularly rich dialogic exchange that was an example of a student who knew what wasn't working for them, but didn't know how to change their behavior. So they basically they felt overwhelmed by an online discussion, as many students do. And uh, the instructor keyed in on this and just suggested that, well, you know, it's OK to do these things. Here's a strategy to get started. And the student tried these things. We saw some movement on the analytics. And I think this last piece is really important because it said, well, it eased the student stress. By getting in one comment, I could feel that I achieved. But I still know that there's more to do. And I think that's a lot about what we want analytics to do. They're a tool to help students along the path to improvement. They're not a magic trick. And so, you know, creating space for that, I think, is important. So that's kind of the whole model as it stands now. And it, it's a starting place. I don't think it's the end of how students interact with learning analytics. But I think having a model for how we bring analytics in for students to look at them is really important because it's not just the tool, but it's going to be the patterns of activity around it. Um, so I'm just going to share a couple of initial findings that we've seen so far, and then uh, a couple of wrap-up comments. Um, the integration that I showed, both technological and pedagogical, seemed to bring analytics in as a coherent part of the learning process as reported by students. Um, so far, we've seen students embracing this notion of agency and setting often recurring personal goals. We didn't see any big brother issues. That doesn't mean they won't happen, but in this case, that was okay. 
Um, the reference frames were really important for making sense of the data, and reactions were both cognitive and emotional. So we saw some things already about students feeling stressed and overwhelmed. We also saw some cases where students basically said, you know, those analytics don't reflect me. People got very defensive. And so I think we need to realize that students are not going to have just a cognitive reaction to say, oh, I'm not doing well in that. I should do better. But also realizing that, you know, they may be feeling stressed, they may be feeling anxious, they may be feeling worried, they might be in denial. You know, we had students saying, well, you can't track how fast I read, even though the metric was actually very, very generous. Reflection on data seems like a powerful starting place. Uh, you didn't see it here, but it turns out that concrete and proximal goal setting is harder. The first set of goals that students set before they saw all the data were, were pretty vague and not, not very measurable. Um, so in some ways, the data may be a better place to start than the goals. And change happens slowly. It isn't always intentional, and it requires support. Dialogue, powerful, but challenges for scalability. And I just wanted to show, I think this is a nice example of a couple of distinct change profiles. And uh, these graphs are, the top one is the percent of posts that students viewed, and the bottom is the percent that they read. And the gap between the two graphs is where we introduce the, the analytics in this particular course. And what you can see here is that this student you know, had high viewing, but wasn't necessarily reading much. Once they saw that was happening, that changed over the next year. And I think that's a pretty startling change. Um, and then for this student, they weren't that far apart with what they were viewing and reading. But with the exception of this week in which they were the facilitator, they were actually pretty low. Um, and then as soon as they started to see the data, they started to improve. Although in this case, you know, it took a while to get up there a few weeks, and then you know, it it's not going to be perfect all the time. So we're not looking for perfection, but I think this shows how the way these analytics were introduced gave students a chance to work with them differently in the context of what they were trying to do. So at the end of the day, I think the small conclusion that I would say is that integrating student use of analytics as part of their learning practices offers an exciting opportunity to help them become purposeful about their learning, to be active agents, and to be making data-informed decisions. At a higher level, I think we need to continue to develop rich indicators that are going to be meaningful to teachers and students. And we need to think about ways that they can play a part in the activity patterns of how students and teachers go about their business. So I, I guess I leave you with one final question, which is, here at Penn State, how can you design ways for analytics to usefully reflect and inform the teaching and learning practices of your universities, instructors, and students in the different contexts in which they work? And so I'd like to say that hopefully we can move from what seems like a big ocean of data to, to channel that energy to, to be something productive, to move it forward, and to make learning analytics part of teaching and learning in productive ways. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. That was wonderful. And I forgot to mention when I, when I made the introduction, uh, I was at recently at the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference where we met. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more when you said students are often at the bottom of that list of stakeholders in learning analytics. And I think one of the reasons we really enjoyed uh, having Alyssa here to talk about her work is she's kind of reversed that and put students at the top, which I think is uh, where they need to be in this kind of pyramid. So as you come up and ask questions, uh, please come up to one of the microphones. And I'll get us started here. I just have a quick question regarding uh, recommendations. So the visual discussion forum, I think, is a really interesting way to help students see their data, see what's going on, uh, and make some judgments on where they want to spend their time. And we talked a little bit yesterday about this. Is there any work in embedding some sort of intelligent agents in there that might make some recommendations maybe on where to go? So you said kind of negotiating ideas is something you're going for here. So is there anything that you think about in the future where something automated might be able to see two different, differing ideas and then say, recommend, you know, that student A go over and visit the post somewhere else. Yeah, I think that falls into that whole suite of areas we have to get to next, which involves the semantic analytics. In other words, getting systems that are, are parsing the text and saying, oh, you know, these posts are similar. You, you should go check that out. Um, I think that's really exciting. It's technically challenging because hopefully all the posts in the discussion are somewhat on the same topic. So finding finding ways to connect them can be, be tricky. I think that we have to figure out what can we do well with the technology and what can we do well with humans. So I think also having a facility for systems to detect that, but also students. So students might say, oh, I see this in 
I see two different posts, I want to connect them. And that's something that technically we've struggled with also because you can have them draw a link between those two, but you end up really quickly with this messy spider web. But I think finding ways that we can parse what's going on and help students find convergence through both automated analysis and through student intelligence, I think is, yeah, I think that's very exciting for where discussion. Um, <clears throat> so I'm working on a uh, dissertation proposal uh, centered around personalization and a lot of the same topics are, that I'm starting to uncover are um, things that you're talking about today. So I'm very interested uh, particularly in looking at um, any literature that you would recommend for um, specifically like goal setting and um, decision making um, centered around students. Um, well, for a full list so, of literature, I think you probably want to send me an email, but um, there's a lot of great work looking at self-regulated learning by uh, Bill Winnie and Allison Hadwin that has that as a cycle, and they look at different kinds of goal setting, and they, there's a few other that have helped you as well. I, uh, I wonder if you've considered having students tag each other in posts that they make as a way of kind of approximating the synthesis from different posts that they're making to save you some of the data legwork? Uh, so saying this, I'm talking to you. Yeah, uh, like I, I like these three. This relates to these three posts and just kind of hashtagging each other. That would be interesting or useful, I guess. Yeah, I think it would be one of the problems that we run uh, run aground with discussions um, that I'm unfortunately I'm not sure that would solve is that then you're popping all over, and so the spatiality of discussions is a real challenge because you want to be able to cluster things in different ways. So I think that could be interesting. I, I almost think that maybe more interesting would be for them to create like an alternate view of the discussion. And so saying, you know, hey, I'm making this post and I want I want you to see my view of the discussion which shows how these things connect and maybe having alternate views. Because you can do that, but then suddenly they're, they're popping about and people get really lost. So I like the idea of tying it, but I think we need to find, find ways to make students' discussion experiences more, more coherent, not fractured. Alyssa, I'm going to ask for one of our uh, guests online, uh, Adelina, uh, is wondering if students see the interventions as being potentially uh, distracting or as extra you know, busy work that they really don't want to get involved in. I think that's always going to be yes for some students. Um, I think the students didn't feel that way often at the beginning. I think one of the challenges is sustaining the effort. And so at the beginning, when the analytics are new and the goal setting is new, that's great. But you know, after you're several weeks in and it turns out, oh, I wanted to change that and I haven't necessarily achieved it, and I'm seeing the same analytics, I think there's that sort of uh, rut of discouragement. And I think, that's, I think that's when it starts to feel like busy work because change hasn't happened quickly enough and students switch gears a little bit. So I think that that's a place we need to think about Again, temporality. Maybe it doesn't have to happen as often. Or what do you do when things lag? Because I think it's tiring being able to monitor yourself all the time, right? Um, especially as it's happening in every area of our life. So I think that it is is a real concern. Can you describe the difference between metrics and analytics, and what the relationships are? So. Um, I see analytics as bigger picture. To me, the metrics are those specific things we're measuring and calculating. Analytics is the larger combination of them, how they're being displayed and shown to students, all of those pieces. So the metrics are, you know, at the end of the day, it's the numbers we've calculated. Analytics become bigger because are we just showing students their metric? Are we showing their metric compared to the class average? Are we showing it compared to a range of what the class did? Are we showing how um, their metrics have changed over time? Are we showing their study patterns over time? That to me is where you move from looking at a single metric to an analytic. I have a question from uh, online. Uh, folks over at the Dutton Institute were asking what tools and software were used to create that visual representation of the discussion forum? Um, this always happens. People get very excited about the visual discussion forum. It's awesome, but it's, um, it is homegrown. I, I don't know that that's an extensible kind of thing. Um, it's, uh, the front end is Java, the back end is uh, done via PHP, and so we, we built that. It was originally a research tool, and uh, it went really well, so we brought it into classrooms. Um, we've had a lot of requests to, to use it. To be honest, it needs to be rebuilt and be made more robust before it's ready 
for that. But the back end of it is exactly the same back end that you see in the regular discussion forum. It was really just the front end that changed. So it's the same PHP background uh, back end that we used with our other regular discussion forum. We just created a different front end to keep both things in different. I'm, I'm wondering if you had any, um, what kind of um, uh, checks on student understanding of the analytics or their ability to use it. Um, and if you look at differences in some students getting the idea of what this is all about or not, and were there differences in some of the outcomes and things that you were seeing? Um, there, we didn't do a special assessment of if they were getting the analytics, but because the way the analytics were used were through this sort of reflective journal dialogue, um, that was pretty clear. There was also interviews um, with some students at the end. Um, and I think the interviews revealed that um, students often, and I think this is a good thing, were, weren't able to separate the analytics from the discussion activity at the end because they had been presented in an integrated way. So what we found was students who got the activity got the analytics. Um, but students who didn't necessarily understand so much the purpose of the activity, they didn't understand you know, why is too many posts a bad thing, didn't connect that with, well, the goal is to, to have deeper posts. And so there was some of that. There was also sometimes students had different views on different analytics. And so students you know, found post length really useful. We didn't think that was going to be a very interesting one. But they found it was quite useful because they could quickly see where they were at. It was something they wanted to monitor. Um, one that I think students didn't understand, uh, they reported that idea of revisiting posts. They sort of said they didn't know what to do with it. They thought they were below or above the class average, but it didn't mean anything to them um, because they didn't get how it fit into the model of what was supposed to be going on. And we've seen, well, revisiting posts is useful for staying involved in the conversation more globally. It helps people be responsive. Often, you need to look at a post more than once to create a, a decent reply. But that wasn't communicated, I think, well enough at the front end. And so that was one they didn't get as much. So I don't think it was that they globally got or didn't get the analytics. It was often analytics specific. Um, one thing we did see that was interesting and one reason why I would advocate continually for a diversity of analytics is that uh, the one I showed at the end, the percent of posts viewed and read, we saw changes on that for a lot, a lot of people because I think it was a big surprise that viewing a post wasn't the same as reading it. But besides that, almost everyone else that we looked at, they showed changes in a couple of the analytics but not the others and they weren't the same. And so I think that was really useful in looking at different profiles of activity and saying that it's not going to have to be one size fits all. So I have an, a question for you uh, having to do with sort of how we might operationalize this for the learners. Because I, I love, as we were having a conversation last night, at dinner my, my head was sort of spinning with the ideas of how do we implement this. So I'm reminded of a Microsoft uh, tool that they used a long time ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago. I think his name was Bob or something. Does anyone remember that? He, he used to pop up oh, at occasional oh, times. Wasn't it Bob? Clippy. Clippy. A paper clip. There you go. So what I'm wondering is, you know, would you advocate for something like a, an avatar or an, I don't want to use the term agent because you've used it in a different context, but you know, so I'm reading my post or I'm preparing my post and, and something is available to me that when I click it, so I, I request that help and it says, well, looking at your, you know, how many times you've posted, you've really not read enough of these yet. You may consider, you know, going through the other post. Then I had this crazy idea of maybe you have one in green and then one in red. And one in red is the devil's advocate. You know? <laughs> and it has, a, it has another. You ought to say something to Kyle Peck about his post, but so I don't know. Any thoughts about how we can start to sort of implement these uh, strategies? Well, I, I think if I recall, Clippy was a phenomenal disaster, and the and and the reason was uh, he it was a he it it the clip Clippy kept popping up all the times when you you didn't want him or her around. So I think step one, you said there's some place that people can go when they want to on demand. I think that makes a big difference. Um, uh, I'm a big proponent of not forcing things down students' throats. Um, I think setting up the framework and making that as a resource could be really, really valuable. Perhaps showing them why they should click it or, or when they should click it could be really useful. Um, I think that, that notion of just-in-time help 
would be really valuable. On the other hand, that's a much smaller granularity than what we were looking at here. So if you had the data to do that, would that would be great. I think at least in my work, we're, we're still we're still a bit far from that that place. I think Jerry's got one for you. Yeah, I have a kind of privacy question uh, that I find when in my classes I teach very large enrollment classes. In one semester, I surveyed 400 students. 80 of them is first language other than English. And there are 28 different languages. So anecdotally, let's say roughly 35 or so different cultures. And I found that the behavior, and I, I can only guess from last names, <clears throat> that about half the students in the class didn't come from the United States or their, their parents came from somewhere else. Uh, and that that, I find affects a lot of the behavior, also economic background. It's, it, and it, I can tell that because of, we have students at Penn State on this campus and then on the regional campuses, which then have different economic background. And that I tailor my teaching a lot to the individuals based on a lot of the assumptions I have about that and the needs that they have and so forth and so on. Now, bringing that in as data would certainly seem to be a violation of their um, civil rights. Although I do find it, anecdotally at least, that it's data that I use all the time. And yeah. I just wonder about that, those problems when you're talking about this and looking at the, in these problems. Well, yeah, there, there's awful, awesome things that people have done informally in their teaching for a long time that, that create problems when I think about doing them in a formal institutionalized way. Um, it's interesting. Because I think there's two two issues in what you're saying. One has to do with English language abilities, and the other has to do with culture. And uh, actually I actually have a doctoral student who was very interested in this exact thing, and she started to dig in the cultural literature. And it turns out there, there's sort of two literatures. There's the world that cares about uh, culture, so a lot of sociocultural work in education that's very rich. And then there's most of the work that's happened in online learning, where culture has been pretty much reduced to uh, demographic boxes and last names. And so uh, the way that we're trying to move away from that, and in fact, there hasn't been a lot of work showing that those tie very well. And so what we're doing, and I think this is a piece of analytics that hasn't been done a lot but needs to come in more, is that what we did, uh, Danielle, Danielle McNamara has a great phrase, which is how can we proxy that? So the things that we can't measure or that maybe we don't want to measure, how do we create proxies for them? And so what we decided was that this notion of culture was really being used as a proxy for a whole bunch of things. For example, one thing we see in online discussions is that students from different cultures may have different perspectives on collectivism and individualism, the degree to which discussion forum is a place for me to say my ideas versus us to come to group harmony. And so instead of trying to um, assess that via something that might be problematic, and in Vancouver we have quite a diverse population as well with students from Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Native Canadians and all sorts of other groups is to say, well, if that's if what we really care about is that, well, why don't we throw together and throw together is uh, the, the the loose way of saying something we spent nearly many months developing um, a survey that assesses that directly. And so instead of using demographic info to proxy things that we don't necessarily want to do, can we figure out what a few of those are and get them to take the survey. It's small, you know, it can be automatically graded, they can see the results, and we can see the results and say, you know, students who have this perspective, you know, often, you know, don't realize that in the discussion in this class, our goal is to actually try and come to group harmony, or that we want you to express disagreement. That's something we often see students have trouble doing. And so I think we've tried to sidestep that a little bit and saying, well, it doesn't matter how good those are as predictors, that's not something that's going to be actionable, right? We're not going to say to a student, well, you come from this culture, we're going to need to uh, change that so you can do better in the course. And so I think there's a big difference in learning analytics between the things that are good predictors and the things that are actionable. And so I'm trying to move away, not, not necessarily away from predictors, but towards things that are actionable. So that, that's how we've addressed that. There's probably other things. Yeah, Jerry. So l last night we had a really good discussion. I want to sort of take that a little uh, further and bring that in front of this group. As well as, I'll start by thanking you for saying we, we really need to be clearer about the purpose for the activities that we build into our, our learning experiences. And I think that, that sort of uh, combines with, so if we, if we use this idea of online conversations, uh, last night we talked about 
you were, you were focused on the listening, sort of the reading aspects. But if we really wanted to, say, improve online conversation, uh, or even academic discourse in face-to-face -face class, or really, we, we talked about how ultimately the experts really just modeling expert behavior. And it seems to me that there's a real opportunity to use learning analytics, um, understanding the part that you, another key point I think you made today was that the negotiation part is hard to take to scale. So when you actually have a conversation between the expert and the individual, that's hard to really to take to scale. But it seems that if we if we did a better job of describing what we mean by academic conversation, what those the purpose of those um, discussion forums are, and then help people sort of understand and maybe even classify as they're reading posts, not just glancing at them. Uh, reading posts sort of classify them as this is a, you know, a, a hypothesis. This is a counter to a Hinman's hypothesis. This is someone's support, supportive statement. This is something else that we could, and then you could give without running the uh, the cost in terms of human time really high. You could give people information about the content of their posts. You know, thirty percent of the people said that eighty percent of your posts. Most people say 80% of your posts were just stickers, you know, nice job stickers <laughs> that you put on there, and, and you're not really giving any content and resources. So if you think not to skip the people who have the wrong answer, and then actually <laughs> sort of the, the question part is, so as you think about going perhaps beyond listening and, and focus, still focus on what, what's the near future and the not so near future of what you're working on in terms of supporting So, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll come to the near and far future in one sec, but what I was going to say is, um, so what you're talking about, there's been a, not a lot, but quite a bit done with students self-tagging their posts that way, and people wanting to run analytics on that. So when you make a post, am I making an argument, am I giving a reason, da 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 da, -da. Uh, And so I think that's been useful, because again, that's, that's you know, anything that saves us having to analyze um, posts with uh, computational linguistics is a, is a pretty good win. Um, and so I think the idea of having students tag others' posts could be interesting. I think, I don't know if I would do it in quite that way, but I do think that we need to get away from the, the, the like. Um, that, that's fine for Facebook. But for learning, people, they, they like posts for all sorts of reasons that are not necessarily what we're looking for, and there's no, there's no meat to that. And so getting students to tag posts, or I would say a series of posts, because if, if a dialogue is about discussion, if we start tagging individually posts, then sometimes we lose the connection. So I would like to see a way to tag a chunk of posts. Like here's a really, you know, here's four posts, and I tag them together as debate. And so I think that starts to become interesting because not every student's going to want to go tag every single post they read, but asking them as a metacognitive activity to go back to, you know, as they're going through the discussion, tag things that are interesting in different ways. So highlight a place, you know, where you see the most interesting debate or where you see consensus or this and that, and doing it to a chunk of posts, not just one. I think it's something I've um, been interested in trying to try for a while. The technology of it is not exactly straightforward, but. So I guess that's probably, that might be more the far future, like the near future, and the opposite one, whichever I decide not to do first, is really trying to leverage some of the work that's already been done with the computational linguistic technologies. I don't want to develop new ones. There's been quite a bunch of good work done, especially at CMU on that. But trying to pull those in to this analytics suite and saying, okay, and in addition to all that, here's some information on the content of your post. And I'm expecting that students are not going to all react well to automated computational linguistic assessments where their post is not given enough reasons or not responsive enough. Now, maybe some younger students will sort of say, okay, thank you, I'll fix that. But I think a lot of other students are going to have um, different kinds of reactions. And how do we work with them engaging with what are pretty exciting and sophisticated analytics that have already been developed, but getting them to engage with that productively? I think that's an interesting and that keeps the human piece involved. So that's probably more than just the uh, So a little bit of a follow-up question. Kyle kind of touched on some things that deal with some scale issues. How, I guess a two-part question. Is there anything we can learn in the analytics worlds from MOOCs 
because they're very different beasts, obviously, than you know the, the, the typical courses that were typically engaged in on universities. Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, what sort of things might the analytics world uh, study and kind of leverage the scale of MOOCs to make some steps forward? Well, I mean, I think, I think the answer has got to be yes. <laughs> Um, I think at the base level, the scale of MOOCs just provide opportunities to, to play with and look at analytical techniques that we don't always have available based on the data sizes we have and find things that are valuable to do. Um, we've seen some, some evidence that models can be transferable, so we could use large data sets to try and build up models. Whether they're transferable to, to our context is something that has to be tested, but I think that, for example, thinking about World Campus, it's not MOOC-like, but it is, is fully online. Um, it'd be interesting to see whether models that you develop would work for MOOCs or vice, uh, vice versa. And I don't know the answer to that, but I think that, that you, know, you have that greater similarity in that you have a diverse population. Um, in some ways, I think MOOCs are a harder place to do learning analytics because you know, we, we've seen that with academic analytics, one of the biggest predictors of student success is you know, student's former GPA and all those sorts of things that in a university you get to know. And you know, if you have even with non-traditional students coming into World Campus, you may know some of the things in MOOCs. You know, everybody is this big question mark. And so I think in some ways that's a harder venue. On the other hand, that's going to push them to maybe find more interesting techniques and more interesting variables that we might not have to reach for, or they may find things that we don't see because you know we've got the 200-pound gorilla of former GPA, which sort of outshadows everything else. They're going to have to look for other things. So I think that's. That's interesting. For, for me, though, I think for MOOCs and analytics and MOOCs to be really interesting is we need to see more interesting pedagogy. And so I think that that kind of goes hand in hand in that direction and that as MOOCs start to do more interesting things with, for example, um, helping students find other students in a large discussion space who are interesting for them to, to talk to and connect with and how do you facilitate that, well, I think that could be really useful on a smaller scale in large classes. Or, for example, it could be useful across classes. And so maybe I think one thing that you could think about transferring from MOOCs to the university setting is, you know, if you start to look across classes, students in the same program area, you know, right now a great discussion forum space for everybody who's you know, studying math isn't going to be very useful. But if we start to find ways to, to make a math MOOC discussion forum useful, maybe some of that can be transferred to help. And then you can start to get some peer learning because you're finding people who are at different phases of the academic program. So that seems like another possibility. Um, so it seems like your presentation largely covered analysis of un, uh, undergrad higher ed courses. Um, are there is there also research, either yours or others, um, looking at um, both in, either informal or professional learning contexts? Um, with online discussions? There is. Uh, it gets a bit harder because the goals are often quite different. Um, Serena Paulus has done some nice analysis of online discussions from a more qualitative perspective, just trying to look at what people are doing there. Um, there's some interesting work kind of coming from the consumer community of practices literature that looks at professional uh, groups that get together online and what they learn from each other. One of the bigger challenges there is um, it's just it's bigger and less well defined what people are trying to get out of it. And so people do a lot of process, the anal process analysis and sort of say, oh, we see these kinds of things going on, but there's less judgment always about if they're good or bad because there's less of a clear answer. Yeah, it, it seems like the goal setting probably switches a lot faster than for students because they have more objectives like, I want to get a job in four years. Yeah, well, and you know, in some sense, um, the informal ones, it's more extended, it's more of a lifelong thing. It, people say, you know, I might just want to feel a part of a, a community or I want to develop my um, identity and feel like an expert in that sort of stuff. And so I think it's a very interesting space. I think that currently it's, it's quite, you can run some of the same kinds of analyses, but the kinds of things you learn are quite different. Thank you. Any other questions? We want to have time for one more. All right, let's thank Alyssa one more time.